everybody, and welcome to Dry Dock episode 30. This Dry Dock episode will be slightly different from the others, because unfortunately, my ISP Virgin Media are about as useful as a chocolate teapot on a summer's day in the Sahara, and the internet is currently broken. So I am going to have to source all the questions for this episode's Dry Dock from Discord, uh, because I can get that on my phone a heck of a lot easier than I can scroll through YouTube comments on my phone. Um, so yeah, apologies for those of you leaving Q&A questions uh, on the videos. I will make that up to you by doing the next dry dock purely sourced from YouTube video comments instead of the usual 50-50 split. Uh, with that said, let's get on with the question. Clay Pigeon asks, how well would the Alaska class have fared at Jutland? Well, the rest of the text of the question puts the Alaskas on the Royal Navy's side, so I guess given their speed and gun uh, caliber, they're probably going to get stuck with the battle cruisers. at which point the only question that remains is, show us on the model where the high seas fleet touched you, I suppose. Um, I mean, come on, it's, you've got two ships, they're probably the fastest ships in well, certainly the fastest capital ships on either side, they have radar directed uh, guns that can outrange anything else on the field. Um, okay, so their armor is not brilliant, but it's still post war armor, um, so it has a slight qualitative advantage over the, the uh, physical material being used on the other ships there. And of course, it is a little bit better distributed than some of the armor on uh, some of the British battle cruisers, say no more, but heck, what the heck, they're not going to be really probably be being hit because they're not going to let anyone get close enough. Um, and yeah, their, their guns have the armor penetration capability of a post-World War One 14-inch gun. How exactly is this going to go work out other than it's going to make mincemeat of the German battle cruisers? Um, yeah, and obviously with the radar they can also see through the fog and the rain and the, the, uh, the gun smoke and everything. So not only is it likely that they pretty much slaughter the German battle cruisers as they come in, or at least heavily damage them enough that the rest of the battle cruisers can finish them off, but it's also very likely that they are able to use their radar to scout and give intelligence uh, to Jellico telling him where the high seas fleet has gone, which means that rather than blundering around in the dark, well, not only do they stand a chance of just picking off German ships during the night, um, which would be scary enough in and of itself, but that also means that if they can keep up communications with Jellico and tell him which direction the high seas fleet are heading, it then in the morning the next day, Jellico is going to be waiting for them rather than guessing for the uh, the wrong entrance the way that he actually did. So yeah, a couple of Alaskas at Jutland, mainly because of their radar and advanced fire control systems. Well, it becomes a one-sided stomp um, in favour of whichever side you put them on. You put them on the Royal Navy side. So there you go. IJN Yamato BB17 asks what would have happened if the Bismarck anti-aircraft was more suited for shooting down aircraft like the swordfish instead of modern aircraft um, the fairy swordfish were hit a lot by Bismarck but the shells just went through the fabric and didn't explode well your main problem there is going to be finding some kind of fuse that actually um, will work uh, even when uh, the, in the channel dash, when a smaller fly of swordfish was shot down by the massed anti-aircraft firepower of the entire uh, small fleet uh, doing that operation, the swordfish was still insanely difficult to shoot down. And that's basically because if you're going to make a contact detonating fuse, it's got to have a certain minimum threshold below which it won't detonate because otherwise you run the risks of detonating it through the acceleration um, that the shell encounters while it's being fired when it hits a lovely wall of air 
uh, as it emerges from the gun barrel or other such uh, wonderful things. I mean, a change in air current or a change in moisture density might set it off if you make it too sensitive. Um, what they really needed was proximity fuses. Um, I mean, if they somehow magically reach forward in time and space and steal proximity fuses from uh, the Allies, then yeah, they well, they shoot down the swordfish, Bismarck almost certainly gets into port in France, and uh, everyone's left very frustrated about avenging the hood until the Bismarck either emerges or gets bombed flat, depending on how long it stays in port. Um, although, I suppose, again, given the way history went, it, you might see a channel dash that involves the Bismarck, but I think having a, a full-fledged, um, full-on battleship in... Uh, French ports, as well as Scharnhorst and Neisenau and Prince Eugen, it's probably going to change the RAF's uh, focus a bit on uh, quite how many much explosive they throw at the uh, at the French docks. Cooper Trooper Three asks, "How much did the Treaty of Versailles affect German naval technology and doctrine?" Well, in short, it murdered it. But that was exactly the intention of the Treaty of Versailles, really. Um, it cut the German fleet way down. It made them actually less effective as a self-defense force than the Prussian and later early Imperial German fleet had been when it was intended as a coastal defense force because they were left with basically obsolete ships and very few of them. So the German Navy, at a stroke of a pen, went from one of the most powerful naval forces in the world with attack tactics, doctrine, and technology designed to fight on large-scale battlefields down to something where they were banned from having a ship uh, that displaced more than a treaty-period heavy cruiser. And as a result, the industry and the technology and the specializations needed for manufacture of capital ships just basically began to atrophy very rapidly. And their only real hope uh, for possibly sustaining their industry past the Versailles period would have been export. But between the economic recessions of the 20s and then the big uh, Great Depression of the 1930s, plus the treaties, the Washington Naval Treaties putting in naval building holidays and restrictions, the export market for warships was pretty dry as well. So yeah, uh, German naval industry and technology took a bit of a dive there. The it's and it, I mean it does show in World War Two the systems that the German Navy, the Kriegsmarine, has that are by far the best and the most technologically well developed, um, are either things like U-boats, which they could hide to a certain extent um, under the des under designs that they the subsidiary arms of the German companies were doing for other countries, um, or things like radar or naval artillery where you could, to a certain extent, maintain the expertise to design these things, or in case of radar, develop the expertise under the guise of other projects that didn't involve capital ships until you put it all together at the last minute. And Doctrine suffered equally, so as I say, it went from being a battle fleet focused fleet to effectively a coastal defence fleet with occasional options for commerce raiding. Um, and although it obviously had ambitions with things like the Z plan to try and uh, act more in a way like a traditional battle fleet, but not quite, none of that really ever came to pass. So, yeah, the, the Treaty of Versailles is, well, unsurprisingly, pretty much directly responsible for the shape of the Kriegsmarine of World War II. Turret Welder asks a related question where he says, were U-boats really the best thing for the Germans to invest in during either world war? Yes and no. <laughs> I know that sounds incredibly unhelpful, um, but hear me out. So, yes, U-boats were the most cost-effective naval unit that Germany produced on a ton tonnage-built versus tonnage-sunk basis. Um far better than destroyers, cruisers, battle cruisers, battleships, etc. Um, and that applies equally across uh, both World War One and World War Two. However, 
whilst they were very effective, and whilst, yes, you could have built many more U-boats for the uh, steel and Deutschmark spent on uh, Bismarck or on the World War I battlecruisers or whatever, um, similar to what I've said in a previous dry dock about uh, cost-effectiveness of ships generally, the Germans in particular did face the problem of their naval industry just flat out was not as large as their opponents. They kept picking fights with that involved getting Britain into the mix. And whilst Germany's industry and naval building industry was arguably definitely in World War One and arguably in World War Two superior to, say, the French or <laughs> the Russians, um there was no way they were ever going to outbuild the UK. And then, of course, they went and both times managed to stick their noses into getting America involved, which was, if if ever there was a footnote in terms of terminal suicide in naval terms in the uh, first half of the 20th century, getting Britain and America on the same side against you is pretty much it. Um, but yeah, anyway, so the problem with the idea of Germany focusing purely on U-boats would be that that would free up the their enemies, specifically as we said Britain and then later America, to focus purely on anti-U-boat weapons. So depth charges, sonar, uh, destroyers, corvettes, frigates, blah blah blah, all this kind of stuff. And that's not a race that Germany is going to win, because if the Allies don't have to worry in the slightest about building or maintaining new warships, because there is no warship threat, then so you could probably walk from New York to London on uh, nose-to-tail destroyer escorts and corvettes. Um, and then the U-boats are a bit stuffed. So, in a way, yes, the U-boat was the most cost-effective unit, but in both wars, the Germans did need their other ships, even if purely as a deterrent. Because you look at World War One. even though the German fleet didn't ever really have a chance of beating the Grand Fleet in a straight fight, and they knew that, it did mean the existence of those ships of the High Seas Fleet meant that the British ha had to have the Grand Fleet, and they had to have the Battle Cruiser Fleet, and they couldn't send all their naval firepower down to, say, try and force the landings at Gallipoli through sheer weight of explosives, um, or it, at, fulfill Admiral Fisher's ambition of loading up half the British Expeditionary Force and uh, marching it onto the German coast and straight down to Berlin, or operating a close blockade, or any of the other things the Royal Navy wanted to do. And similarly, in World War II, the invasion of Norway certainly wouldn't have been possible without the Kriegsmarine, um, and large amounts of Allied resources, which again could have been used elsewhere, were tied down by this, the existence of Kriegsmarine heavy surface units, um, which then caused strains on resources as the Allies tried to build up superiority in both surface units and anti-submarine weapons, because remember, although the Allies do have superior industry, if you want to absolutely nail down and lock down a potential threat like the Tirpitz or the High Seas Fleet, you not only have to have more ships, you have to have them in significantly greater quantities because unless it's a single fleet that you can bottle up in a single port, you've got to have superiority everywhere or within easy reach of everywhere, which involves having a heck of a lot more ships uh, than the ship that's causing you a problem. Eugenie Godfrey Fawcett asks, if HMS Dreadnought was such a massive step change, how many pre-Dreadnoughts could it have fought successfully at one time? Well, believe it or not, um, Admiral Fisher, as part of his uh, justification to the Royal Navy to actually get the thing built in the first place, actually had to answer this exact question. And his response was that he was pretty much certain that the Dreadnought could take on any two pre-Dreadnought battleships quite comfortably and win, and he estimated that it would stand a pretty good chance against any three. And to a certain extent, you can see where he's coming from. Um, I mean, Dreadnought has an eight-gun broadside versus a four-gun for a uh, quote-unquote uh, regular pre-Dreadnought. Um, so the Dreadnought can, in theory, um, fire an equal weight salvo 
of four guns at each pre-dreadnought, and it has more advanced fire controls equipment and rangefinders, so it's more likely to get hits in faster. Um, and the reason that Fisher thought he could possibly uh, pull this off against three was because with its turbine engines, Dreadnought was not only three knots faster than your average brew Dreadnought, but it could sustain that speed during battle with a lot less vibrations. Albeit that in his infinite wisdom, he didn't spot that the designers had stuck the main mast with the fire control spotting position behind the first funnel, which, um, as you might imagine, was not the most pleasant or, shall we say, livable environment to ever be. Um, but anyway, his idea was that, in theory, a dreadnought would be able to defeat three pre-dreadnought battleships basically by not fighting them all at once. Uh, it would use its superior speed to just go, OK, well, I'm going to pick one, whether it's the front or the back of the line, I don't care, but I'm just going to pick one, I'm going to fight that, cripple or destroy it, move on to the next one, move on to the next one. They can't run away because I can catch them, and they can't fight me all at once in the open sea because I can just pick and choose when I fight and where. So that stood, that stood a reasonable chance of actually working, again, as I say, assuming that the Dreadnought could hit anything um, assuming they hadn't parboiled the poor range find get finder keeper alive uh, with the final spoke. Life Beyond Living asks, uh, what would the Admiral class battle cruisers have looked like if the Royal Navy wasn't misinformed about the Mackensons? So this is with regards to the fact that one of the reasons Hood was constructed with 15-inch uh, guns in the same layout as the Queen Elizabeth's was that the Royal Navy believed that the Mackensons were battlecruisers armed with eight 15-inch guns. So they thought, well, we've got to at least match that. Um, obviously, in the event, the Mackensons had a sort of a very weird calibre of uh, nearly 14-inch, but not quite, uh, calibre guns. But that's neither here nor there. Um, in the end, the Erzatz Yorks did, did actually have exactly the element the British were worried about. Um, but anyway, so what would they have looked like if, say, the British had got accurate information? Well, there's two possibilities, really. Well, the answer is surprisingly not that different from the Admiral class. Um, after the Tiger... The British didn't build any battle cruisers for a couple of years because they had the Queen Elizabeth class um, with, uh, well, the fifth and potentially sixth uh, units of that class, and then they went over to the Revenge class. Um, there is a sketch design that was rejected mainly for having poor underwater protection from the 1914-15 period, which uh, was labelled as Design Y. And Design Y is effectively the full fully battle cruiser version of the revenge class so much like the hood class it has eight 15 inch guns in four twin turrets two forward and two aft um it's slightly slower than hood at 30 knots and slightly less well protected it doesn't have inclined arm it's just slab sided and it's 11 inches thick which okay yeah it's not as well protected um but it's still a hell of a lot better protected than any other British battle cruiser up to that point. Um, so yeah, it's a sort of slightly smaller, slightly cheaper, but same kind of armament. So if they'd found out about the Mackinsons, but then known that their armament was still uh, going to be this sort of 13.8 inch caliber, they probably would have dusted off that design Y and maybe uh, refined a few bits here and there and uh, gone with that. So yeah, it, maybe not quite as large, not quite as graceful, not quite as long-lasting as Hood, but certainly um, certainly an interesting ship, or series of ships, and quite pro possibly uh, ships that would have seen service as a whole squadron through to World War II with updates. Instead of getting Renown, Repulse, and Hood, you probably would have had three or four of these things. Life Beyond Living also asks, what systems, if any, did vessels during the World Wars use to scrub their exhaust smoke, and how do they compare to more modern ones? Well, I must admit my first reaction was something along the lines of uh, in environmental 
concerns in the early 20th century. This is a period where they thought going to watch the local nuclear bomb testing after World War II was good for your health. Um, I don't think they cared all that much about uh, scrubbing their, their funnel smoke, especially when the funnel smoke was one of the key parts of making a smoke screen um, when you wanted to. So having some kind of scrubber that reduced that, uh, possibly slightly counterproductive in terms of naval warfare. To be honest, um, the main way of getting be uh, reduced smoke from your funnels, uh, both to make navigation easier because that smoke tends to drift and then can clog up your vision, um, and to help with your gun sighting as well for similar reasons, the main way of making sure you had less funnel smoke was just to get better fuel, especially in the Colt era. This is why the British were so determined to, to uh, keep their hands on as much wealth, uh, wealth? Welsh coal as humanly possible as it burned very cleanly um, and similarly with uh, fuel oil mixes once they went over to oil firing you could get some pretty nasty oils or oil, fuel oil that would um, really gunk everything up and obviously uh, better mixes which uh, wouldn't produce quite the uh, moving smokestack there were a few experiments, of course, but this was mostly on either civilian ships, uh, cruise liners and the such, where they wanted to maintain a really neat and clean appearance. And occasionally there's some evidence that certain commerce raiders tried to use um, smoke suppressants to make themselves a little bit more stealthy. But to be perfectly honest, it's not something I could find a great deal of information about. Krizimir Korzinek asks, what would have happened if the Austro-Hungarian Navy sorted out of the Adriatic to cover the retreat of Goben and Breslau, as the Germans had initially hoped, and a large engagement broke out between the Austro-German force and the Entente forces? Well, it would have needed a spectacular amount of luck and good timing to have a combined Austro-German battle against uh, the Allied forces, because, well... The Germans were doing their level best to get away from a bunch of British battle cruisers that were following them, um, and of course you had a armoured cruiser squadron heading south towards them as well. So I can't imagine any real plausible scenario short of them deliberately turning towards the Austro-Hungarians, maybe um, to try and link up with them for some reason. Uh, maybe they decide to go and uh, join the uh, Austro-Hungarian um, Navy instead of the Ottomans. Um, but yeah, so assuming that happens, let's look at the lineup that's possible. Well, it doesn't look very good for the Allies, to be honest, because the French fleet is still stuck out in the west of the Mediterranean, mostly guarding uh, troop transports, bringing back colonial forces, and the one a group of uh, French battleships that had been freed up to try and hunt down Goben and Breslau had gone in completely the wrong direction. Um, so you have a squadron of armoured cruisers, two 12-inch armed battle cruisers, and a handful of destroyers, and ranged against that you potentially have anything up to uh, Goben, of course, itself, a, a Moltke-class battle cruiser, probably... Uh, um, well, more a lot more effective than the uh, the I class battle cruisers, but on the other hand, it's not going to be quite as one sided as you might think because at this point, um, the British battle cruisers haven't adopted the uh, rather explosive ammunition handling procedures that uh, BT's ships would it by the time of Jutland, at which point. They are not just going to explode in fireballs, but they're probably not going to handle the fight particularly well, although it is a two-on-one, but one-on-one, -on -one, they're at a disadvantage. Um, on top of that, you have anything up to three of the Tegethoff class, um, three more fairly useful pre-dreadnoughts, and then six more dread pre-dreadnoughts of questionable quality, uh, which is the maximum that the Austro-Hungarian Navy can put out to sea. But to be perfectly honest, 
even if just the three Tegethoffs show up, that's three Dreadnought battleships plus a battlecruiser versus two battlecruisers and a handful of armoured cruisers. It's not going to go very well um, for the British if they try and fight. Um, quite possibly if the armoured cruisers and uh, battlecruisers manage to corner Goban and Breslau before the Austro-Hungarians can uh, catch up and engage, then yeah, they can put the Goban and Breslau down that way. But if the Austro-Hungarian force and the German force manage to link up, then it's pretty much a case of, well, Goban and Breslau are now going into Austria-Hungary. And I don't think there's anything the British can do about it. Baron Dew asks, what was the first ship to use radar in battle, and how did it fare? And what was the last surface ship on surface ship RAM that was successful? Well, by surface to surface ship ram, I'm going to presume you mean um, deliberate in the context of naval warfare, because uh, otherwise that kind of thing's still happening quite a bit. Um, yeah, let, let, let's not mention the Seventh Fleet and all the shenanigans over in the Far East at the moment, shall we? Anyway, so you've got a possibility of three answers here. If you want to go for the criteria of large ocean-going ships and was actually a declared war, then the last incident I can find of deliberate surface-to-surface -surface ramming, uh, not including obviously uh, ramming submarines, was actually glowworm ramming Hipper near the beginning of World War II. If you want to go for last major recorded uh, ramming incident between surface vessels of a war-making sort of any type. Um, there was a fight between motor gunboats and motor torpedo boats and German E-boats or S-boats in April 1945, where both E-boats and uh, motor gunboats were the rammers and the rammies in various parts of the skirmish. And then option the third would be that if you want to go with ocean-going uh, ships in government service deliberately ramming other ships but not strictly in a case of declared war um, that would be then the so-called cod wars in the 1970s where um, mostly it was mostly icelandic vessels ramming the british but eventually the british got a little bit fed up and there may or may not have been a few uh, accidentally deliberately on purpose ramming attempts by uh, the british as well so yeah there you go Oak Tree asks, did the US Navy gain much real benefit from their relatively lavish use of special treatment steel in warship production uh, leading into and during World War II? So, yes, to a certain degree, um, there were advantages for the US Navy in using special treatment steel. The main one being that special treatment steel, although it was incredibly expensive and difficult to work with compared to your regular structural mild steel. Um, it did have a, a much higher yield strength and um, a lot more tensile strength, so it, it was a tougher steel. The main problem was that as, uh, as, as the strength of a steel goes up, it tends to become more brittle and less flexible, which for a ship as a whole is not necessarily th something you want in its main structural members um, because believe it or not ships flex and move with the water um, and something that doesn't really want to flex or move very much will then end up taking far too much load on itself um, even well in excess of uh, what you would expect uh, to find um, and what it would be able to cope with it it might be a much stronger steel um, but it could induce a loading on itself that would be massively in excess of um, its own strength and vastly in excess of what a slightly more flexible steel might uh, have to put up with. So, but the, the reason I say this is the advantages is because it is this uh, much tougher in areas where you don't uh, necessarily need to worry about massive flexing. Um, you can then build that particular bit of structure out of special treatment steel, and the special treatment steel not only will be a little bit more durable when it comes to things like um, absorbing shell splinters and such like, 
but because it's a lot stronger per unit of however you want to measure it in feet or thickness or whatever, uh, but because it is a lot stronger, you can build the same structure with the same load bearing capacity out of less steel, which then saves you on weight. Um, which means that you can get, if you're building a treaty era ship, you can get more ship um, in the areas that matter or the same displacement. Or if you're going to build something outside the treaty limits, like say an Iowa or a Montana, you can still keep the weight down and thus increase lethality versus displacement by using special treatment steel in place of mild steel in all of these sort of structural areas where you don't have to worry too much about extreme loads and flexing. So yeah, there's a definite advantage to using special treatment steel in addition to the uh, aforesaid um, ability to soak up uh, splinter damage and blast damage and even small shell damage um, much better than your average structural steel. Um, and so yeah, th those are the advantages, I think, the main ones anyway. Prefect, he uh, asks a two-part question. Uh, the first part being about safety equipment used uh, in ships and yes, as he mentions, that probably is a question for its own video. But second question, a quicker one, he asks, is the favourite age of sail vessel that isn't British? Favourite age of sail ship that isn't British? It's a very close run thing. And a couple of designs do come to mind, like things like the American Super Frigates, but they probably slightly beaten out for me by the French Ocean class ships of the line. They were very large for their time, very well designed, had the potential to be highly effective, and they were one of very, very few actual mass manufactured um, ships of the line. Uh, first rates, that is. Um, there were sort of batch manufacturers of third rates and such like, but most first rates tended to be um, sort of almost handcrafted sing single units, one-off ships, um, even if they were derivatives of earlier designs. So the fact that the Ocean class managed to get almost full serial production status um, to me that represents quite an achievement in the age of sales so i would have to as a naval historian put them as my favorite non-british ship of the line in the age of sail or age of sail ship anyway tack covert 4 asks would the battle cruiser have been more successful as a capital ship had the major theatre of war been more open than the North Sea, say if the first war involving dreadnought types had been mostly in the Atlantic or Pacific instead, where the distance is more vast and the chance of a full fleet engagement like Jutland is less likely versus a series of engagements more akin to Dogger Bank. In theory, yes. I mean, it depends who the combatants are, but this kind of wide-ranging, large-scale, um, open-ocean warfare is exactly the environment the original battle cruisers were designed for, at least as far as the British design paradigm pre World War One goes. Um, remember, these are ships that originally were supposed to take the place of the armored cruiser, so they're supposed to be able to range out over the open ocean, um, finding enemy cruiser forces, scouting forces, raiding forces, etc., and chase down practically anything and kill it. Um, it's supposed to not have anything to fear from enemy cruiser forces and other such things. The only thing it really fears is the enemy battle fleet. And as you just mentioned, if you put it in the middle of uh, something like the Atlantic or the Pacific, the chances of running into said enemy battle fleet become markedly less. And you have a whole ocean to escape into if uh, you do happen to run into them, as opposed to you see something like uh, enclosed waters like the Mediterranean with uh, Goban and Breslau, where... Yes, their speed did help them escape, but it also meant that they basically just had to run and hightail it as fast as possible across the med to get to a friendly port, because otherwise, if they stopped anywhere else, they would be quickly cornered, surrounded, and uh, killed horribly. So, yeah, uh, battle cruisers, assuming that there was some kind of uh, large fight over an, an open ocean like that definitely uh, would have had a lot more tick boxes to their name as opposed to um, 
what they have these days. Last Southerner asks, what would you say were the most and least successful interwar battleship refits out of the ones that were majorly rebuilt, e.g. Uh, Cavoir, Doria, Queen Elizabeth, Fuso, Congo, etc., respectively in terms of improving the ship's performance? Now, it depends how you define performance, because the answer for best or worst is actually, in some ways, almost the same ship class, depending on how you define it. Um, when you talk about successful... Okay, so, well, let's try and cover both briefly. If you want to talk about terms of actual ship performance, as in what are their stats on paper before the ship goes into refit, what are their stats on paper after they come out... Um, then probably you're looking at the Congo class being the best refit because the Congo class went in as sort of World War One ish era speed battle cruisers um, with no particularly great protection um, and such like, and they came out as um, mu they came out much faster with their new engines. Um, they came out with a level of armor protection that was greatly improved, albeit not tremendously useful against other capital ships, but it did render them in uh, original battlecruiser design fashion back up to being likely immune to 8-inch uh, and 6-inch shell fire, which their previous arm scheme definitely had not. Um, hence, they were de redefined to buy some as battleships. So, yeah, in that respect, performance-wise, massive boost. If you want to look at it in terms of battle performance-wise in actual combat, they kind of switch all the way back down to the bottom because... Ultimately, they were battle cruisers, and trying to convert a battle cruiser into a battleship, it just doesn't work. Especially if it was built and armored like a classic World War One battle cruiser, which the Congos were. And just sort of look at the uh, achievements, quote unquote, of the Congo class. The one time they came up against an enemy actual capital ship, even with the South Dakota. Uh, basically unable to shoot back, they weren't able to particularly imperil the South Dakota even at point-blank range, and then it was curtains when Washington showed up. The others didn't really have that much of a successful career, but then again, let's face it, we are talking Imperial Japanese Navy versus US Navy in World War II. Um, not having a successful career is kind of uh, par for the course unless you're uh, an early war carrier on the Japanese side. The interesting thing is most of the other big interwar refits, the Queen Elizabeth's uh, HMS Renown, arguably, and the Italian World War One ships, actually ended up facing off against each other, mostly in the Mediterranean. Um, so, yeah, again, in terms of paper performance before and after, the Italian ships theoretically had a better refit than the Queen Elizabeth. They came out of it... Um, with improved armament, they came out of it with faster speed, etc., etc. Um, whereas the Queen Elizabeths, um, they didn't come out of it with any particularly faster speed. They didn't come out of it with um, bigger or changed guns, albeit they did get in increased elevation for longer range and better fire control systems. Um, but they obviously did get as anti aircraft upgrades and things like that. So realistically um you could say the paper performance increase for the italian ships was better but the fact was a queen elizabeth was always going to um take a cavoir or a or a dulio to bre to breakfast quite easily anyway so the general upgrade that it got although its paper performance stats didn't go up quite as much still left them by far the superior vessels um, although it would have been interesting to see uh, quite how the uh, Queen Elizabeths would have performed if, as well as their, the major refit they did receive, they had had something like the uh, Congos or the Italian ships had where you have sort of a one-for-one -one replacement of boilers and you suddenly have a Queen Elizabeth class with several tens of thousands of more horsepower able to keep up with maybe a King George V. Um, that would have been quite the fun thing to see.
Mr. Analog Cog asks, what was the usual cause of a ship being sunk in World War I? Torpedoes, destruction of pumps, or too many watertight compartments being flooded? Well, um, usually one of those leads to the others. Um, but I get, I, get, I get the general gist of what you're trying to, to ask. Um, the most common cause of warships being sunk in World War One, by far and away, has to be um, underwater explosives, torpedoes, and mines. With um, it's kind of an even split one way or the other. Torpedoes did in for quite a few more um, major warships as individual units, albeit that mines scored the most spectacular success with the sinking of HMS Audacious. Um, and then you, you, you have, I mean, obviously there were ships that were sunk by shell fire at the various naval engagements. Jutland, of course, counted for quite a few of them, um, including obviously a bunch of battle cruisers. Um, but the thing about those naval battles is that they were relatively few and far between, whereas torpedoes and mines took a steady toll throughout the rest of it. So in purely numerical terms, it's going to be a coin toss between torpedoes and mines for the loss of major warships, although... Outside of the Audacious, um, which obviously went down to a mine, and the Pomerne, which went down to a torpedo, most of the other spectacular naval losses in terms of major capital ships, battleships and battle cruisers, um, were mostly down to naval gunfire. Um, but tonnage-wise, that's quite a lot. And size-wise, that's quite a lot, but in terms of pure numbers, not so much. And finally, Life Beyond Living asks, what did nations do with the guns from decommissioned warships? Well, it depended greatly on what warship was being decommissioned and when. Um, some decommissioned guns, especially if they were sort of light to medium caliber weapons of sort of the 5, 6 to 8 inch variety, could and would be reused, um, especially if there were other ships in service, perhaps newer ones, that still used the same guns. Um, those gun barrels could obviously then go into reserve for the, the later ships. Um, they could be repurposed, uh, like with the Brazilian monitor Parnaiba, where its uh, initial main gun and then actually its, its next main gun as well uh, came from decommissioned warships uh, that uh, obviously then surrendered their weapons. Um... Obviously, if you decommission a warship in the World War II period with something like a 40mm Bofors, it's just like, oh, well, take it away, slap it onto another ship that's still in service. Um, the bigger guns, where you're talking about capital ship grade guns and such, um, if they could not be used on another ship, like, say, if you were to decommission an R-class battleship, you could still use the 15-inch guns on another 15-inch armed ship, but if you couldn't do that, then you'd either scrap them, um, or if it was more sort of during peacetime period, you might keep them in a reserve pool or send them to uh, be installed in coastal defences or in World War One, possibly even um, very heavy land-based artillery for use on the front lines. Um, so yeah, there's almost as many fates for uh, naval guns of that. Uh, big naval guns from decommissioned warships as there are um, <laughs> uses for a gun. Um, I mean, in World War II, some decommissioned uh, naval guns even end up as tank guns uh, because it turns out that something in the uh, 3 to 4.7 inch calibre, whilst they might not be considered all that much uh, good as naval guns, suddenly become very, very powerful when you mount them on a tank and start driving them around the local scenery. And that wraps up this episode of The Dry Dock. Thank you very much for listening, and hopefully this will be being posted on time, assuming, as I said before, that my ISP decides to actually do its job for a change and supply, you know, the internet. Uh, be nice. Can hope and dream. Anyway, see you again in another video.